the ninth <clears throat> Sunday after Pentecost. We'll be back again in Melbourne. And the epistle on this ninth Sunday. It's also the feast of the Transfiguration of our Lord, August the sixth. <clears throat> the epistle for this ninth Sunday is taken from Saint Paul's letter to the Corinthians, first letter of Corinthians, chapter ten. <clears throat> Brethren, we must not fix our desires on evil as our fathers did, nor relapse into idolatry as some of them did. For <clears throat> the scripture says, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play, nor commit fornication as some of them did. And 23,000 met uh, their uh, deaths in one day. Nor took the Lord as some of them did, and they were killed by the by the serpents. Nor grumble, nor as some of them did, and they were killed by the destroying angel. All those things which happened to them had a figurative sense, and were written down for the instruction of ourselves, who live at the end of the ages. The lesson is that the man who thinks it, that he he stands. Let, let, secure must take take heed lest he fall. So far you have encountered no temptation but that is more than man can can bear. And God is not God is to be trusted. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond your strength. With temptation he will give you the means of, of escaping from it, and you will be able to persevere. In the gospel, taking that according to St. Luke chapter 19. At that time, Jesus was approaching Jerusalem. When he, was, when, when, he, when he saw the city, he wept over it. If, only thou, 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 if thou only knew that today, he said, the things that were for thy peace, as it is, as it is they are hidden from your eyes. The days will come when the enemies will erect a rampart about you, about you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will, they will dash you to the ground, you and your children within you, and you will, you will, not, leave, and will not leave one stone upon another because And not leave one stone upon another, because thou didst not know, know the time of thy visitation. Then he went into the temple, and drove out those who were trading there. And he said to them, The scripture says, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Then, th then day after, by day he was teaching daily in the temple. Thus far the words of today's holy gospel. So today, the ninth Sunday of Pentecost, but it's also this August the 6th, the Feast of the Transfiguration of our Lord, and just a few considerations, and the, uh, uh, in the, in the, in the day that says, Feast of the Transfiguration of our Lord, <coughs> We have here two visitations. Two visitations. St. Leo the Great says that when you look at the gospel, our Lord Jesus Christ is always telling his apostles that they must suffer and they must bear the trials of daily life and must bear the tribulations in this life and they will receive a reward. But the reward is going to come when they go to heaven. The reward is going to come in the next life. The reward is always in the future. And so he speaks to them about his, constantly he says about his death, speaks to them constantly about his passion, that he is coming to this world to die for our sins. And the old, so the death is imminent, the passion is imminent, the suffering is imminent, but the reward is at the end. So therefore, on one particular day, he took his most beloved apostles, Peter, James, and John up to the top of the Mount of Transfiguration. 
And when he brought them to the top of the mountain, he showed them a beautiful vision of himself and his great glory. And then he, he, Elias and Moses came and spoke with Christ. And there they were with, with Christ on the top of the mountain, seeing the great glory of Christ, the beauty of Christ. And so he let them have a taste of the glory. And so that near we have St. Leo says, Our Lord does speak much of his passion. He speaks much of his suffering. But he will show time of glory. He will show his glory. And then St. Peter makes a mistake. St. Peter says, Lord, it is good for us to be here. It's good for us to be here. For he is so happy to be raptured up in the, in the taken up in the glory of the supernatural things that it happens when one learns the supernatural things and the supernatural delights and the beauty of living the Catholic life and the beauty of the Catholic faith and the beauty of all the divine truths and all the sacredness of the gospel the, and the sacredness of both testaments. For both testaments, beauty is there. We have Enoch, or rather Elias and Moses, representing the beauty and the truth of the Old Testament. And then we have, says St. John Chrysostom, Peter, James, and John, representing the truth of the New Testament. And note that these two testaments are together, says St. John Chrysostom in his sermon on the, on the Transfiguration. He says, notice the two testaments are the same. There is not one doctrine in the previous testament, the Old Testament, another doctrine in the New Testament. For instance, many of the heretics say, the God of justice and the God of vengeance he was the God of the Old Testament. And the God of mercy and the God of forgiveness is the God of the New Testament. And they forget that one day an old prophet of the Old Testament named Jonas, he ran away from God when God told him that he was to tell the Ninevites that they were going to be destroyed. And they forget that Jonas ran away from God. And when he finally spoke to God, he said, why did, why did you run away after the fish had thrown him back on the shore? He said, because I know you. You say you're going to destroy the Ninevites, but you're going to change your mind. You tell me to go to them and tell them they're going to have fire and brimstone. You tell me that they're, that they're going to be put to death. And I know you, Lord, that you will say you're going to destroy. And then you will change your mind and you won't destroy. For you always forgive. This is the God of the Old Testament. And so the God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New. And also, we can consider the justice. Or the, war, the mention of hell is 63 times alone in the New Testament. Christ speaks of hell multiple times. He speaks, for instance, of Lazarus and the rich man. But the rich man did not break the Ten Commandments. The rich man was always fulfilling the law of God. And the rich man burns in hell, according to Jesus Christ. So our Lord Jesus Christ is most strict. And he explains... That the man burns in hell because of the fact that he did not help Lazarus, the poor, the poor beggar at the, at the gates of his house. So even they obeyed the commandments, even though he fulfilled all the prayers of the church, of the Old Testament, did all the law, obeyment of the laws of the Old Testament, did not have the vice of impurity and greed and so on, he did not help Lazarus. And therefore, he was damned. And so the God of the New Testament is strict, and the God of the Old Testament is strict. And the God of the New Testament is filled with the divine mercy, and the God of the Old Testament is filled with the divine mercy. And then St. John Chrysostom says, there is no difference between the God of the New and the God of the Old Testament, like many heretics climb, climb, try to say. And so, they, and, and, and therefore, Moses and Elias are there <laughs> with St. Peter, St. James, and St. John. And they are there with Christ, so that there is one divine truth, Old and New Testament. They are the same. And there is a great consolation given to Peter, James, and John. And our Lord allows consolation. He says we have to suffer. He says we have to bear trials. But then St. Peter makes a mistake, says St. Leo the Great. St. Peter does not do something wrong. He simply makes a little mistake. He says, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let's build a tent for thee and for Moses and for Elias. So let's build a tent and let's stay on top of this mountain. Now his request was not wicked. And therefore St. Leo says, Our Lord does not respond and say, You have done wrong. He is silent. 
but rather a thundering voice comes from heaven with great power and majesty, striking fear inside of Peter, James, and John. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Hear ye him. So the Lord speaks from the Mount of Consolation. He speaks from the Mount <coughs> of the Transfiguration. And he says, <coughs> hear Christ. Christ says, I am going <coughs> to the cross. And therefore, St. Leo says, we will receive consolations in life, but we are to prepare to endure, for the glory will come in the next life. Prepare to endure, prepare for trials, always be ready for trials and to endure, and the great glory will come in the next life. And our Lord will show little signs of glory in this life. He will give us continuous consolations in this life. We find it in the lives of the saints. They endure great trials and great tribulations. But they experience joys that are far beyond any joy that we ever experience. They had great visions. St. Paul himself, our Lord, said to St. Paul, or rather to, uh, to uh, Ananias, the one who cured St. Paul, he says, you must go to the Saul of Tarsus and cure him of his blindness, for I must make him know how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And so he went and cured Saul of Tarsus. He became St. Paul. And he has suffered so much for the sake of Christ. But then St. Paul himself says, in, my, in myself I shall not glory, my infirmities I shall not glory. But there was a man 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body I know not, God knows, that such a man was taken up to the third heaven to see things forbidden for man to see, to hear things forbidden for man to hear. Of such a one I will glory. And here St. Paul was speaking of his own self. Whereas 14 years before he wrote these words, he was taken up to see the very sight of heaven, to hear the words of the angels. He was given great strength and great consolation. And what did St. Paul do with it? He carried that consolation, he carried that strength, and he was able to spend a night and a day in the sea. And when he was a night and a day in the sea, he remembered the beauty of heaven. And when he was going to the cross, he remembered the beauty of heaven. We see this aspect missing and all modern tales about crucifixion, <laughs> and all modern tales about suffering. When the saints go to suffering, they don't make the mistake that Peter, James, and John did. Peter, James, and John saw Christ, and they made a mistake. Let's stay here on top of this mountain. St. Leo says, no, that's a mistake. They don't want to stay on top of this mountain. There's several reasons not to stay on top of this mountain. One of them is that the beauty of the sight of Christ in this glory and the beauty of hearing the words of Moses and Elias, the greatest of the prophets, speaking to Christ, is nothing compared to the conversations of heaven. And nothing compared to the beauty of heaven. It is but a very small taste. And if you tasted the true beatific vision, you would never want to go back to this little bitty consolation. And also, this consolation is a strengthening of the soul. And why is it there? So you can get back down in the battlefield. And then there is a mistake. A kind of selfishness that can enter into the supernatural soul. I want to live only in contemplation. I want to live only in the, in, the, in the prayer. I want to live only in the sight of God. And this is a beautiful thing. But we must go back down on the battlefield. And we must not abandon the others. Because there's nine apostles at the bottom of the mountain. Three apostles on top of the mountain. If they build tents there and they stay on top of the mountain, they shall abandon the other nine. And our Lord Jesus Christ will not tolerate the lack of charity. He will not tolerate that they alone live in consolation and safety on top of the mountain. And that they abandon the nine at the bottom. So they must go back down the mountain. And they are, they are given strength to be able to persevere through the three hours of the agony. And they don't persevere. But they will teach the other saints how to persevere. So that when St. Lawrence goes to be roasted on the gridiron. When St. Lawrence is martyred twice, the gridiron roasting was his second martyrdom. After he had been tortured and, skinned and partially skinned and beaten, and then he went and found the treasures of the church, then he came back completely wounded, and then he was roasted on the gridiron. He was filled with such joy, because he knew that by the suffering of the gridiron, by the suffering of the fire, by the suffering of the beating, he was receiving a greater glory. And he was receiving a greater and greater glory. And while he was in that pain, he saw the glory of God. The same is true of St. Stephen in his martyrdom. 
as he knew he was about to go to death, as he knew that his enemies, when the enemies of God were about to destroy him, he saw the Son of Man in great glory in heaven. So when the saints go to death, when they go to be suffered, they remember and experience the most wonderful consolation. It is said of St. John de Brito, that we mentioned many times, the Jesuit, for which the reason why I wear the red sash, and I wear the red sash in South India in honor of St. John de Brito, who's, who made the blood, his blood made the sand in, in, the, in the place where he died, in Orir in South India, in Tamil Nadu. The, blood, the sand turned red from his blood, and it remains red now, 300 years after he died. And the place of the red sand, the place of the blood of John of St. John de Brito, and even the Hindus noted, when he finally was able to be martyred, after many years striving to be a martyr, they themselves noted that they saw no greater joy, and could imagine no greater joy on a human face than on the face of John de Brito as he went to die. What is consolation? Consolation is given to St. Peter and St. St. James and St. John. The three first apostles. Peter, the one who is the first head of the church. James, the one who will be the first martyr. And John, the first beloved. And he gives them a special consolation. So that when the time comes that they will experience suffering, they will remember the beauty of the gospel and the beauty of the faith. And it will carry them through. Because remember our Lord Jesus Christ says, prepare for trials, prepare for tribulations, Prepare for a hard life. Prepare for difficulties. Prepare for hard times. And then he makes sure we have almost no suffering. And then he protects us from all the blows of the enemy. If we could see right now the millions of devils that are surrounding this house, and right now the millions of devils that want to destroy this mass, and the millions of devils who want to destroy our souls, and they, are, they have great power and they have great strength. And they are trying to destroy us. But it, I believe it is the, 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 uh, no, forget the, the principalities, the powers, the powers. One of the powers, I believe it is, one of the choirs of the angels, their duty is simply to hold back the devils. And the powers are here right now. And they are holding back the devils. And then we could see how much power is in the powers that hold back the devils that keep them from being able to cause us even the slightest harm. They want all the plants dead. They want all the animals dead. They want all the rocks destroyed. They want destruction all around. The devils do. And they are trying to destroy our souls. And at this very moment, they are being prevented. They are not allowed. And they are filled with the greatest frustration, which is the beginning of eternal, just a, or actually in their case, a continuation of eternal frustration. We think we're experiencing great trials and tribulations, but we have small ones. St. Leo says, prepare for trials. <coughs> prepare to endure. And when our, our Lord will give us great consolations, He will give us great sights of the beauty of His face, the beauty of His, of his faith, and give us many examples how the, our fathers all went through, the, through trials and tribulations and all came out from the other side. From our, the Lord, many of the tribulations are just, says the sacred scripture, and from every one of them, the Lord has delivered them. And if we remain just, and we remain with God, we will be delivered. So there is going to come a consolation. The consolations will be given to us from time to time. Let these consolations be a source of strength for us, and that to, to persevere in the time of trouble. Let me go back to the today, the ninth Sunday after Pentecost. And today is the ninth Sunday after Pentecost, and on this Sunday, we consider our Lord Jesus Christ going into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And as he comes over the top of the Mount of Olivet, he looks down upon Jerusalem, and he says, If only thou hadst known this, the things that were for thy peace, if only thou hadst known the time of thy visitation, and the things that were for thy peace, you don't know it's the time of your visitation. If only you knew that in a few years, says St. Leo, only in a few years, the Romans are going to come in the year 70 A.D. They're going to build a rampart about thee. They're going to encircle thee on every side. They're going to rip down the city, and there shall be not one stone upon the other. And St. Leo, who lives in the 400s, St. Leo says, and even to this day, the city has not been rebuilt. 
Now, of course, 2,000 years later, the city has gone over. He says, For they built a new, the Romans did such great destruction that the new city of Jerusalem was built outside the old city and built next to it. And even now, 400 years later, you can go to Jerusalem, says St. Leo, 400 years after the Romans have destroyed it. And you will see that not one stone is upon another. You will see the entire city was destroyed. And there was so much destruction that the people dare not even build for over 400 years on the site of the original Jerusalem. They built on the other side. In a similar way, in Goa, in India, in the original town of, 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 of Gold Goa, was hit by a plague because of a curse of St. Francis Xavier. If they turn against God, they will be hit by a plague. And that little area was hit by a plague, and almost everyone in the city died. A city of about 300,000 people, like a, like a little mini Portugal. A beautiful European city in the middle of India. And they died. Almost all of them died in a plague. And yet those who are outside the city, those only a few miles away, they didn't get sick at all. And over 300,000 died in that city by a plague of one year in 1741. It was around that time. And when the churches remained, and now in Old Goa, the churches are still there. These churches once were packed, and there were houses all around these churches. Now, 300 years later, there are only the churches. There are no houses, and even after 300 years, people will not live there. They build a new city of Panjim a few miles down the road outside of the city. And after 300 years, the people still don't live in the place where they all died in one year. And so St. Leo says, so terrible was the destruction of Jerusalem, that this was not like the sacking of another city, it was a true punishment of God. And even now, 400 years later, they still have not built, for great is the visitation of God. If only they must know the time of thy visitation, the visitation of the judgment of God. Now, Lord Jesus Christ, from time to time, lets us see the beauty of his faith, the beauty of his face, the beauty of his gospel. St. Anthony, for instance, you see St. Anthony, the greatest of all the preachers, he always has, you see him with a, with a book. He used to have a book. The reason why he's patron of, of law things, there was a book that he used, it was, that he used to prepare his sermons from and read and pray from. And that book one day was stolen by the devil. And St. Anthony said, get my book back. And the angels brought back his book. The wolf came in the name of the devil and took it and brought the back the book. And also that's why he carries that book. And then also he used to, at nighttime, prepare his sermons. He would read his book. But then he would go to the altar, and he would go to the side of the altar, and our Lord Jesus Christ would stand on the altar as a little baby. And, and St. Anthony would hold Christ as a baby in his arms. And then he would put Christ upon the altar, and he would speak to him and speak to him and speak to him about the things of God. And when he spoke to our Lord Jesus Christ about in the night, as he talked to him through the night, and held him in his arms through the night, the little boy Jesus, those things he would preach about in the morning. And so St. Anthony converted thousands of souls to Christ. He had many consolations, and he suffered greatly. And the same is true of all the saints, and not only of the saints, but look at our own lives. We're going to have consolations. And our Lord Jesus Christ gives us little consolations hither and, and here and there in order to strengthen our souls for the fight. And we must endure in the time of battle. Right now we're in a time of endurance as we're in this earth. Always attack. The enemies always hate us, but they never succeed. They will always try to destroy us, but they will not succeed. And we have to stand firm in the faith and thank God for his great faith that he's given to us and have great confidence in the consolations of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he wanted to build three tents, St. Peter. No, that was not the time for that. He would discover later on his consolation when he was going to be crucified when he was finally able to be crucified for our Lord. And it was in joy and tears that he went to be crucified. And St. Peter said, I am not worthy to die like my master. It was, it was too great a joy to be crucified as Christ was crucified. And therefore he said, rather let me be crucified upside down, that I not be crucified as my master. And therefore they crucified him upside down. And he died in such a way in great joy. And St. John died in great joy. And James died in great joy in Jerusalem when he was put to death. And so <clears throat> that sorrow and joy, we're going to find that they can never be separated one from another. 
And sorrow is temporary. It's in this life. Sorrow is for a short time. And the sorrows experienced in this life build up rewards and build up uh, glory to be retained forever in the next life. And then God gives a joy in this life to be replaced by eternal joy in the next. As St. Teresa <coughs> of, uh, of Avila said, <coughs> there is no such thing as a sad saint. No such thing. We are in a very sad world today. We're in a world of great sorrow and sadness. And why is it? Because there are not saints. Saints are the cause of joy. And the saints are what bring happiness to a world. Because saints know that there is sorrow. And sorrow is not the most terrible thing in the world. That there is pain. But this sorrow and pain can be turned into the greatest of joy when it is simply united to the great wounds of the Holy Cross and made and received in reparation for our own sins, and suffered for the good of the love of God, and the love of our neighbor, the love of souls, and then love transforms pain and gives it meaning. And love makes pain into something beautiful and magnificent. And so we have to have a great charity and love in our hearts to try to understand what is the value of suffering. And God will always give consolation. Otherwise, we may have the temptation of Jerusalem, 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 how many times did the prophets visit thee? And what, would, what was Jerusalem doing? Like many souls, Jerusalem, of course, is the city of peace. And Jerusalem also stands for our souls. And what was Jerusalem doing on the day of Palm Sunday? St. Saint, Saint Augustine says, Consider the two times when Christ went into the temple. The first time was at the very beginning of his public ministry, when he had not yet performed any miracles. His first visit to the temple was to cast out the money changers. His last visit on a Sunday was to cast out the money changers. He would go on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday into the temple before Holy Thursday. But his, his first visit that he ever walked in the temple, he cast out the money changers and he says, This is my father's house. And you have made it a place of negotiation. You made it into a house of business. <clears throat> Come back again, says St. Augustine. Three years later, he comes back into the temple and he casts out the money changers again. And he is far more angry than he was the first time. He's far more violent than he was the first time. He attacks the doves. He attacks the sheep. He attacks the, 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 the cattle and so on. He attacks the money changers and he attacks everyone. He drives them out of the temple. The power of the anger of Christ. And this time he says, you, this is my father's house, which you have made a den of thieves. Before it was a place of negotiation. You can negotiate, says St. Augustine. You can transact business, but don't transact it on Sunday. You can transact business, but don't transact it in the temple. But when he comes back, he says, you have made this a den of thieves. And he is more angry. And he had just then prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem. So the two visitations, when you look at them on the, on, uh, by a photograph, the angry Christ comes in in the very beginning of his public ministry. And today in the Gospel, the angry Christ comes in at the end. He looks angry. He turns over the temples. The videos look the same. But the one is the death and the end of Jerusalem, and the other is only a warning. And we are reminded of Samson. And what it tells us in the sacred scripture concerning, concerning Samson he sinned with Delilah, and he sinned, and he sinned, and he sinned. And he was forgiven, forgiven, and forgiven. And in the final time, he told Delilah about the secret of his hair. And he broke the command of God, and she gave him a haircut. Didn't seem like a very painful thing at all. And he went out, and he said, I will shake myself as I did before. And the scripture tells us in the book of Judges, and he knew not that the Lord had left him. Now in this day of Jerusalem, they know not the Lord has left them. They know not that it is a time of visitation. And this is the warning to the soul that is about to be damned. That is the Catholic soul. The city that belongs, the soul that belongs to Jerusalem. The soul that is in the true faith. You will not know the time of your visitation. You are going about your business. And why is it switched from a house of negotiation to a den of thieves? Now, a man who is a Catholic he must work business. He must have a job. He must collect money. He must transact business with men. 
But in the beginning, these things begin to become important, but we still love God, we still adore God. And the negotiation begins to enter into our church. It begins to enter into our prayer. It begins to enter into our religious life. And it slowly it takes it over. It is not yet fully taken over when Christ begins his public ministry. But when he comes today and throws out the money changers in great anger, the St. Matthew tells us, it is no longer business, it is religion. When we look at the world today, not only the pagans, but also the Catholics, and also the traditional Catholics. Ask them, what is a good mommy? What is a good daddy? A good mommy and a good daddy, these are those who prepare their children to have a good education in some vomitopious, vile, and disgusting university that will give them a worthless piece of crap paper that will give them a lot of money when they go out in the world. Because they have a degree, they will be able to make good money and good business. I'm very proud of my son because he started a, a plastic toy company and he is making worthless, disgusting toys for $100 billion a month that he has done very well for himself. I am very proud of my daughter because no one tells her what to do. She's the CEO of a company and she's very successful. She's an accountant. She is a, a doctor. She is a lawyer. She is a very successful person. What does this mean? Your house is a den of thieves. And one day it will be visited by Jesus Christ. And he will not be in a good mood. And he will come and he will say, Thou dost not know the time of thy visitation. Do you not know that God will provide for the material needs of those who love him? They, the, the birds of the air... And the, so the lilies of the field neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. But the Heavenly Father takes care of each one of them. We must recognize that we are in an age in which man looks at work, man looks at housing, man looks at business as God, as religion. And hence we are called thieves. Now St. Augustine says, why are you a thief? Because everything that is owned in this world is owned by God. Everything is a gift of God, given to us freely out of His abundance. It is owned by Him. I am not the owner of my house. I am only a steward. Jesus Christ never refers to any of us as anything other than a steward. What does a steward do? He watches over someone else's house. What does a vicar do? He watches over someone else's kingdom. So we must watch over Christ's house and watch over God's things. But one day we think, that's my things. Now when a steward comes in and says, this is mine, he has just become a thief. He is no longer a steward, he is a thief. And this is the problem that Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ on Palm Sunday, with great wrath and great anger, he goes into the temple of Jerusalem much more angry than he was the first time three years before. There are degrees of his anger. And he casts over the, the tables like he did before. But if you look more closely, you'll see there's more violence in his casting. There's more violence in his throwing out the doves. More violence in his attacking the sheep. More violence in his attacking the, uh, the money changers. If only thou hast known the time of thy visitation. They were upset that their things were destroyed. And there is another thing, another sign. We don't want, uh, we, we believe that our possessions are ours. And our possessions are the importance, are, are centered on ourselves. Our money is ours, our possessions are ours. And we devote how much of our time living for money? How much of our heart? How much of our thoughts? It is more in importance more in time, more in everything, than whatever is given to God. And therefore, we must say that we are idolaters. The modern man, the majority of men who are baptized Catholics, are idolaters. And they adore money. And they adore business. And they adore the success of the world. And on Sundays, they go and praise Jesus. And they even say their rosaries once in a while. And they go and adore our Lord of the Blessed Sacrament sometimes. 
Because after all, you need someone to help you to make your business increase. Go and visit India. They have great devotion to all the gods. And all the gods have one job. Make me rich. All of them. There are millions of gods, but they only have one responsibility. Make me rich. Give me the wealth of this world. Make me live in glory. That's the responsibility of the gods. And so now we, we believe that's the responsibility of the one true God. And it has entered deep into the hearts of our souls and is a most grave problem of our time. Hence Christ visits the Catholic Church. He visits the Catholic soul. And he is visiting with anger. Visiting with anger. And thou didst not know the time of thy visitation. And one day they will build a wall about thee. And they will cast a rampart about thee. And they will just straighten thee on every side. This is what's happening to our church right now. The whole church is despised by the world, and wisely so. For the members of that church have turned against God. And even the pagans know there are many Balaams of our time. Many, many Balaams. Balaam, the false prophet, the wicked prophet, was told to curse the Jews. He tried to curse them. He couldn't do it. And they always told the king, don't worry, their God is more powerful than my false gods. Said Balaam, he's more powerful. But don't worry, you can defeat the Jews. All you have to do is send your women into the camp. Send your women into the camp of the Jews. And they will turn away from their God. And they will, when, if they turn away from their God, anyone can defeat them. If they are faithful to their God, no one can defeat them. You know, there are many Satanists, many enemies of the church who know this truth. They know very well that if we are faithful to our God, the only true God, and we are faithful to the, His commands, we cannot be defeated. And if we are unfaithful to them, even the smallest and weakest of men can destroy us. It all depends upon our fidelity or infidelity. So we have two visitations in the Gospel today. The visitation that Christ speaks of Ninth Sunday after Pentecost, and the visitation of the Holy Ghost, of the, of, and of the, Moses and Elias, and with the Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ on top of the Mount of Transfiguration. And God will allow these visitations. We will receive visitation from God if we are faithful. We will receive consolations from time to time. And when these consolations come, they are to strengthen us to endure during the time of tribulation. And if we turn too much to the world, and turns too much to the things of this world, too much in our lives, then there's great trouble on the horizon for us. Great trouble. So let's, let's persevere in this time of trouble. And remember also, it's a temptation to be a, too much prepared for hard times. The way to prepare for hard times is the knowledge and love of God and the perseverance of the faith. And this is the way to prepare for hard times. We know hard times are coming upon us at some time, but our Lord Jesus Christ knows better those hard times. The Blessed Virgin Mary knows better those hard times. The saints know better those hard times, and they will get us through. The angels will get us through, and they will get us through. So in any case, let's not receive the visitation of the anger of Christ on Palm Sunday, but the visitation of our Lord on the mountain of transfiguration, and the beautiful visitation of the Holy Cross. That visitation is the one that is the most beautiful of all that brings about our salvation. Bless you all, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.